the natural thing to do, like any other object which is scarce, is to put a price to it. And our economies need to find institutional arrangements um, which will make the use of natural capital in whatever role uh, households, firms, the states and communities um, wish to, uh, to pay for it, to make it sufficiently costly. Now, of course, it shouldn't be too costly. Somehow the prices need to be, or the, the costs that people who are making use of it face should reflect its scarcity, taking into account not only the desires and ambitions of the current generation, but the um, taking into account in a, uh, the, the uh, pr prospective demands or needs of future generations. So we should think of natural capital in much the way we think about re reproducible capital, like bridges, machines, um, roads. We don't often ask, are we pricing those correctly? We somehow feel that a combination of state and market decisions brings about, roughly speaking, the right amount. But of course it, they don't, because a key, key component in the manufacture and use of these capital uh, objects, uh, capital assets like roads and buildings, is natural capital, which is being underpriced. So you have a really odd situation where for years and years and years we have been underpricing natural capital, by which I mean that people do not pay an appropriate amount to make use of them. So it's not surprising that we would be over-exploiting them. Um. Capital. And I think the first um, uh, reaction that a person who hears for the first time that natural capital ought to be priced is that it's likely to be impossible. And at one level it is. There will be s many types of natural capital which will be uh, not, it will not be possible to price them. Sacred Grove. Well, typically we have solutions to them, just as we do for churches or temples. Um, you, if you want to raise a church and say, well, let, let's have an uh, apartment house there, you really balk. We don't do that usually. We find reason not to, right? So we don't say how much a particular church or temple is worth we avoid that question, but effectively put a fence around it, saying that this is hallowed ground and we're not going to touch it. Okay? So likewise, there will be certain types of natural capital which may be historically important or seen as being sacred, which cannot be priced, but it will be the same form as this, and we shouldn't feel paralyzed by that fear that we can't, uh, can't price them. Then there are a whole category of uh, assets which have their worth in terms of the services they provide us in being able to exist, produce goods and services and so forth. Bees, insects, birds provide an enormous amount of service, number of services for us. Pollination uh, is one primary one, okay? Um, and you can work out the productivity of these objects, bees and birds and so forth, at different sites by trying to estimate what help they provide in agricultural production or production of or in orchards and so forth. Because they're factors of production, if you like. Now, of course, you might then say, well, there are additional values to them because they're God's creatures. Fine. But you see, it's always good to start with the most conservative attitude to the value of natural capital, because partly because others get worry, very worried that you're just a uh, tree hugger and don't like development, and partly also because if the conservative values tell us to be much more wary of depleting natural capital, 
then putting higher prices to them, of course, will reinforce that. So it's already the job is partly done. Then there are types of natural capital, and that's where, in some ways, the, uh, the most uh, effort on the part of economists has gone, which is to value natural capital, those kinds of natural capital which are amenities, parks, beaches, uh, recreational grounds, that sort of thing. And there are now pretty sophisticated methods of trying to estimate the value in terms of the willingness to pay on the basis of people who are using it. But in my judgment, uh, if you want to tie nature with economic development, then the action really is at the earlier level, the kinds of the valuations that I was suggesting a minute ago, which is to do with, say, valuing a, a watershed. A watershed produces huge numbers of uh, services which are unpriced. Say, forest in the uplands, upstream forests protect soil downstream, and soil downstream is cultivated or used by farmers. So the forests are protecting the farmers, and deforestation upstream is going to affect the productivity of the farmers. And you need a series. First of all, there is no single policy, obviously, just as in any other context. There will be very site-specific, um, context-specific policies. But the general tenor of the policies is clear. First, um, people who use natural capital, uh, say the timber f firm, which is deforested, uh, should be made to pay for it sufficiently stiffly uh, to reflect the worth of that. So that's first. Now when I, say, when I say they have to pay for it, I don't necessarily mean in terms of a market, by the way. It should be quite clear. It could be in the form of taxes which is not a market. Uh, it's a government-imposed price on the community or the person involved. Secondly, it need not be the state either. It, need, it could be communitarian rules and regulations, which used to be very customary in the past, when before there was a proper state in many parts of the world. In Africa, for example, much of the usage of natural capital, and this is true also in Asia, by the way, uh, was mediated by social norms of behavior. Because there are local natural capital, say a local fishery, coastal fishery. A village has access to the fishery in the coast near it, near the village. So they can monitor each other, and there are agreements as to how much they can fish and so forth and so on. Problems arise when you have oceanic fisheries where the monitoring is so much difficult and, so, and you certainly can't use communitarian rules because many nations might be involved and you need that then international regulations and so forth. So when I say people have to pay for it or need to pay for it or feel the cost of it when they use it, it could come through various guises. In some cases it could be market. So these days people talk about um, payment for ecosystem services, for example. So that's like creating a market. Or it could be the state imposing taxes, or it could be communitarian rules and norms where actually cash payments are not being made, but people are exercising restraint due to the fact that they'll be punished one way or the other if they break it. So that's one. Second, you need serious distributional moves. Because if in a particular context the payment needs to be made by some of the poorer people because they don't have a say, communitarian solution to the problem, then they need to be compensated. Not for the, uh, not they, they should pay for it, but then on the other hand they should receive a subsidy, a lump sum maybe, or, or some, some such thing. Now in, in the West we have that too. I may be paying, a, 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 in, in my case, for example, I pay tax at a furious rate on my income. But on the other hand, I have subsidies coming galore. I use it, the buses free because of my age. So there are complicated ways of transfers and, uh, that are available. And a good government would ensure that 
on the one hand, for efficiency's sake, you're not jeopardizing natural capital. And that might mean people having to pay who can't really afford it. But simultaneously, they are subsidized in other ways to keep themselves from falling down. Um, that's one thing. But on the other hand, the idea that the poor would lose on account of green measures, to use your kind of expression, I think is very misleading and mischievous. It's mischievous because it's say an excuse not to do anything about natural capital. And it's also mischievous because it gives weight to predatory businesses who exploit natural capital in other countries, let alone their own, and get away scot-free. So one of, one of